So I'm just going to speak into this space what is real this morning. Pretending to be a functioning adult in this life is absolutely exhausting. Anybody give an amen for that? Woo! Yeah, clap, snip, snip. Yep. So, you know, maybe you're like me that when I was young and single and had my whole life ahead of me, when I was thinking about the ways that I would curate the life that I led and how I would basically make meaning out of my world, the picture was pretty close to a Norman Rockwell painting, right? You've got a, a, a good uh, nuclear family that's all around a table with perfect steaming food that somehow just appears in, uh, in your orbit in front of you. And uh, I was really just hoping that it would have that sense of warmth and the light cascading from behind you with this beautiful uh, full-length window and that all would be right with the world. I bet a lot of us have that picture, uh, or at least had it at one time, and there is a place for uh, beautiful optimism. But I have a sense that for most of us, whatever picture we hold and the reality in which we stand, there is a chasm that is too great for us to even describe at times between those two realities. It's like the other week, I was coming home. Uh, for once, we were all able to come home together, all five of us, and we were walking into the door and came into the kitchen. Now, the kitchen is usually the place that we live, and we try to at least keep that one room clean, right? All the others can be a complete wreck, but that's the one that at least needs to be functional. And we walked in and Taylor and I looked at each other as we looked all around and saw these fast food bags and containers and different things from takeout food over the week that for whatever reason, whatever was going on, we didn't even have energy to put in the trash can. And certainly any dishes that we used that they weren't done in that sink. And I say all this to you to say, that every single one of us has perhaps gotten to that point where our lives are so fast and perhaps uh, untenable as far as everything that we're holding that we grab whatever resources we can no matter how good or unhealthy they are for us we grab that which is needed to survive so for us as we think about this last topic in harvesting the learning through the pandemic that we are making our way by walking in through real time. I came across an article from Arianna Huffman and it, she called it the connection between burnout and climate change or the world crisis, right? Now I don't want to f uh, focus specifically on that, but she, uh, she said that the way that we live and the way that we as human beings work is literally destroying us on all fronts. Now, when we talk about burnout and sustainability, whether it be in a human life or in the larger creation in which we live, I want us to kind of be clear about some terms because I don't want to assume anything. So when we talk about burnout, I'd imagine that many of us could give witness to what that is. I'm just going to say a working understanding would be whatever exhaustion or depletion uh, that we might experience of emotional, mental, and physical uh, struggle uh, caused by excessive or prolonged stress. Burnout happens not because we're just trying to solve problems, but because we're trying to solve, as Susan Scott says, the same problem over and over and over again. Think about it. Every single one of us, our lives are driven not just by what happens to us, but by what opportunities are presented and the primal drivers that lead us to say yes to some things and no to some others. Here's 
It's just a couple of examples that I see with people in my sphere of influence right now. When we think about uh, uh, that which uh, is a problem that we solve over and over again with our lives, there are some who solve that problem through seeking acceptance and affirmation or approval. And they do whatever they can, no matter who they hurt or uh, what seems ethically not quite on point to achieve that goal for their heart. I think about others that may go into a place of paralysis from experiences of crisis or trauma, that maybe even this season feels like that which just cannot be lived because it's too painful. And so we do whatever we can to put safeguards around us so that that experience of heaviness and fear and frustration might not be so alive in our everyday experience. It's painful to think about, really, because every single one of us, if we can dig down deep enough, we have those drivers and the problems that are solved again and again, ones that we continue to grapple with, ones that characterize our life and need healing. That healing is part of what sustainability talks about. It's almost a posture of, of uh, resistance to that which would uh, steal our health or our joy. Sustainability is that avoidance of depletion of natural resources in order to main, maintain some kind of balance, whether it's an eco ecological balance or whether it is internal social-emotional balance. It's a real thing that actually can be attained, at least in fits and starts in the human life. So why do I bring all this up to you, to me, for us to kind of hold in a place of curiosity today? Because as we think about the whole of God's creation, everything in this world that we can see and enjoy and interact with, uh, even in the riches in which we stand uh, in the state of Louisiana, we have all sorts of natural resources to be able to point to and ones that we need to tend and ones that we need to protect. But I would suggest to you, as I'm just coming to claim for myself at my age and stage of life, that human beings are actually the greatest natural resource that God ever gave to the world. Human beings, our time, our attention, our passion, our care, our industriousness and in living into the call to dominion that was given from the very beginning to women and men, siblings in the faith. We are the greatest natural resource that we can see. So this pandemic reality certainly has had an effect on us, whether we are willfully blind to it or not. And we have to acknowledge both the science of how the planet works and how uh, our surroundings are affected by uh, that reality, and then the science, too, of how human beings work. Because we can't ignore it, even if we tried. You notice that you're probably in some way, shape, or form burned out, depleted, uh, exhausted, some days with no creativity, some days with only enough energy to survive for the day. And uh, in those kinds of spaces, especially if they are longer term than we are comfortable, we find ourselves in a place where we can't create more sustainable habits, let alone keep the ones that are just keeping us fed and watered <laughs> and doing the basic things that are a part of our work and family life. We're also unable to think about the future or make the wisest decisions for the long term, or come up with any kind of creative or innovative solution that is necessarily to complex challenges in our individual or collective lives. And that's ironic because 
the, the paradox, the upside down of that is that this is the kind of time where we need that kind of openness of mind and, and collaboration and capacity to hold uncertainty more than ever when we have so little of it. No wonder society today is kind of at these fission and, and tension points. These are the kinds of times where the brain doesn't really help us either. So as God created us, we find ourselves in a place where all of those faculties of our mind, where we uh, can hold creativity and collaboration and, and all of the, the nuance that life is bringing to us right now, when we're in stages like this, that stuff is sidelined. It is, in fact, just turned completely off. And then our prefrontal cortex, the very thing uh, that has helped us survive from the most uh, beginning days of being human, just to survive being uh, uh, taken by predators or to survive uh, cold weather or hard things um, in life. These are the kinds of parts of our brain that are the most active and possibly the ones that are most dangerous for us, for us to engage. Because in these times, as you know, usually our brain would send uh, through, uh, through the neural synapses, I, you know, I, I'm a humanities person, I'm a theology person, but I know enough to know that when uh, there is no complex thinking to go to, the neurons and the, the, uh, all of the connections are rewired to the most basic form of what it is to be human. The kind of connections that just look at how I'm going to get mine and get it fast in a short-term way. These are the, the times and the places where uh, we're much less likely to spot the proverbial iceberg before it hits the Titanic in our work life or in other spheres of our living. These are the times where it is easier and sometimes we even find ourselves justifying the, the blurred lines or the fuzzy ethics that come from uh, relational uh, lines that seemed not okay months ago but are the thing that are giving us joy in life now. We're not always grappling with the collateral damage that that can bring. Or we do become uh, just kind of paralyzed because it all feels like too much. This ne uh, Yale neuroscientist Amy Arnston really does talk about stress, even good stress, having that same kind of effect if it is chronic. So for us, we have to think about what is needed right now. In our lives, what do we have to be real about to even begin to live in to hearing God's voice as uh, the scripture tells us is the call of the day, in fact the call of a generation. I think about a really simple story about a sheep named Chris, they called it, uh, that's from Australia and uh, the story goes that this sheep was actually not owned by anyone, by a farm or by a family, and so it was just kind of roaming on its own from what they time-dated it back to a total of seven years. And you can imagine if you know anything about those kinds of animals, they have really thick fleece, uh, thick fur, and uh, it began to grow and grow to the point where it even affected their eyesight, even affected this animal's ability to move or to have basic body function. And so they found him and brought him back uh, to a place where he could be tended to. And all of that fleece, over the course of it's told 42 minutes, when usually that kind of procedure of just uh, cutting it all off would take about three, it was so complicated because over seven years uh, of that time, it had become so enmeshed and a part of his body, they couldn't see the forest through the trees, if you will. It was an official world record, <laughs> the 89 pounds of fleece that they took off. And I have to wonder whether that's something of a metaphor that we can hold for our own lives. 
that whether we can see it in you or in me or not, each one of us are holding an unbelievable amount of weight that often uh, goes unspoken and unacknowledged. And it can get enmeshed in our world where we don't even know where to begin to start unraveling it and cutting it away. I think that's where, as we speak to this seven-year jubilee, uh, God is calling us to begin to, even if it feels like too big to tackle all at once, to take one step and to do what seems like the next right thing. Our scripture today that Monel read for us, it is a piece of the larger discourse of Jesus talking about uh, the I am sayings. Basically, one of the most accessible ways that you can break open who God is through the window of Jesus, through the way that Jesus reveals who God is in the world during his ministry and time here. These I am sayings are ones that I often, when I'm dealing with uh, someone in, in relationship with someone who's interested about uh, following Jesus again, uh, just in a spiritual way, or connecting with a church and beginning again in a more formal way, these I am sayings are a great place to begin, to uh, come to a deeper understanding of who God is and what God's promises to us may be. Jesus is the bread, it says. Jesus is the light, a path, a gate, a vine, the good shepherd. And it's assumed that our hearts are made more peace-filled in remembering that Jesus fulfills all of these necessities in life in various ways of helping us see vision and helping us to have the provision and protection that we need for basic physical and emotional and spiritual needs. It turns out that the Good Shepherd is not just an image that we assume brings comfort for children. I was sharing with a Sunday school class just the, this past hour that uh, the Good Shepherd uh, metaphor really was spoken into a critical time for uh, the, the Christians that were living into their faith in a time of opposition, a time of occupation. The Gospel of John is written at a time where it was about 20, 25, 30 years after the Jewish temple had been destroyed, everything that they held onto as people of faith that were following in the way, all of it was gone. And you can imagine, just to kind of get into that heart space, the head space, the emotional space, that if something uh, happened to us that was similarly uh, just devastating, this right hand of the sanctuary might have gone on to other countries and other lands and said, there's nothing more that we can do here. We need to find abundant life elsewhere. And then maybe this left panel decided to stay and stick it out and see what uh, they could do even as they were worshiping in small homes, quietly uh, offering prayer and trying to help each other remember who they were without all of the trappings and all of the signs and all of the ritual and all of the tradition that they held dear and held them to know what is true and sure about their lives. It might be hard for us in a church where we are, are free to speak of this and to worship as we please, but for this small group of folks worshiping in the dark and in secret to know that they truly had a good shepherd, a shepherd that would lead them, a shepherd that would even lay down his life across the gate for them to uh, shield them from any harm that might come their way, that would speak literally into their lives as they faced death at different points along the way. John's Gospel is one of the most simple and most complicated. It is described, uh, one says it, as a book in which a child can wade and an elephant can swim. So this text does tell us something about God, and it tells us certainly something about us as well. I said that it tells us about God and that God really does lead us. Even when 
our capacity to see that leading or to hear that leading or to understand the patterns of where that leading is calling us to go, God still leads us in a sure way, one and the same. What does it tell us about our lives in a timeless way? I'd say what I receive from it is that we know that God leads us, but we don't always trust and believe it. We don't trust God's promise. And you can see it, not just in what we say or don't say, but in what we do and don't do. Uh, the ways that we live frantically, trying to grasp onto any stronghold we can find, no matter how healthy or un unhealthy for our lives it may be, it is the thing that feels sure for the moment. This franticness is part of a people, we, that may not be able to hold on to a truth that seems fleeting when we look at our present circumstances right in front of us. But we're invited to live beyond that franticness into a place where one will lead us to the food we need even for the day and to still waters. You could hear in all of the songs that we uh, sang this morning, even uh, thinking about LSU Sunday with the uh, Death Valley, right? I mean, I have a whole different connection to that uh, first hymn we sang, just thinking about the context we minister into. And in Psalm 23, it does talk about that provision that God offers in the midst of a frank frantic and ambitious uh, existence I've been reading a lot of David White lately. He's a poet, somebody, some folks would call him a philosopher, uh, but he wrote a work called Ambition that I've found really helpful lately. And I wanted to share one piece with you as it relates to our calling from God and how we can perceive it differently and even in a way that might be uncomfortable. He says, a life's work is not a series of stepping stones onto which we calmly place our feet but more like an ocean crossing together where there's no path only a heading only a direction in conversation with the elements around us looking back we see the wake that we have left as only a brief glimmering trace on the waters. You know, as we think about what all this might mean for us, when we know how, in fact, fleeting this life can sometimes be, it might create some small sense of urgency in us to vote for the kind of world that we want with what we do or even more, what we don't do. I heard this week just a, a really simple saying that making people uh, face themselves and consider the many individual changes they could uh, enact in their lives ultimately leads to a collective will if we all lean into that together. Small everyday changes that develop our collective consciousness, or in our case as a church, our collective heart. That's where real change is found. That's where even as burnout is real, we can fight both crises without and within in the very same way, seeking the work of healing that can only begin with the one person you can control the one person that God has called us to begin with, to save. So in talking about all of the things that we have grappled with in this pandemic, I pray that there is maybe one step that God is already compelling you to begin with as an outgrowth of our worship today. However simple or complex it is, I pray that over this week you'll pull that challenge through and begin to meet that challenge with uh, a, even a small bit of courage and determination 
to see where God will meet you on the journey as we make the small changes that make the biggest difference. As we close today thinking about those next steps that we'll take, I'd like to offer a blessing from Jan Richardson just to center us and to commission us for the road ahead. It's called A Blessing in the Chaos. Let us pray. To all that is chaotic in you, let there come silence. Let there be a calming of the clamoring, a stilling of the voices that have laid their claim, that have made their home in you. Those that go with you even to the holiest places but will not let you rest, will not let you hear your life with wholeness or feel the grace that fashioned you. Let what distracts you cease. Let what divides you cease. Let there come an end to what diminishes and demeans and let depart all that keeps you in its cage. And let there be an opening into the quiet that lies beneath the chaos where you find the peace you did not think possible and see what shimmers within the storm. May it be so for you and for me. Amen.